Well, amen. That was good. I enjoyed that. I don't think I've heard that song in a hundred years. And, and, and Sally played that song about Jehovah. Wow, I hadn't heard that in so long. A great, wonderful gospel song. Are you ready? You got your Bibles? Let's turn to the book of Luke. Uh, book of, let's turn to Mark first. Mark chapter 3. And, uh, and we'll begin reading in Mark chapter 3 and verse 13. Mark chapter 3 and verse 13. And he, Jesus, goeth up into a mountain and calleth unto him whom he would, and they came unto him. Jesus had been down by the lake. There was a great number of people, and he called several of them to come out from there and go up in the mountain with him. And he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that uh, he might send them forth to preach, and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons. And Simon he surnamed Peter, and James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James, and he surnamed them Boanerges, which is the sons of thunder. And Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon the Canaanite and Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him, and they went into a house. They came back out of the hill and went into a house down in Capernaum. Now, it's interesting as you read this that Jesus did not give an epitaph to any of the others, uh, but he did to James and John. And he called them the sons of thunder. I, I don't know about you, but that name to me, uh, it represents something special. I mean, these guys really must have had some fire in them to be called the sons of thunder. And, uh, and we're going to be looking at that in a few moments. But I want you to look at, first of all, uh, at, at three basic thoughts here about this whole experience in the life of the, of the apostles. First of all, I want you to notice um, Jesus in his companionship with them. Did you notice what it said? It said he called them unto him whom he would, and they came to him, and he ordained them that he might send them forth to preach. But notice what he said. They came to him, and he ordained them that they might or should be with him. There's something special about that. Of all the people on the earth and thousands of people that he had ministered to and hundreds of them that followed him where he went, he called these to him so that they might be with him. There's something about our Lord in his earthly ministry, and I think it is true in heaven today, and that is his desire for companionship with his people. He desired to have fellowship with them. There's a companionship here. Uh, it's so important that, you know, the Lord hasn't changed. He wants fellowship with us. Uh, the Bible says over in the book of 1 John that uh, they, he wrote, that is, John had written these things to the Christians, and he said, I write these unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father, and with his son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you as joy may be full. Do you see it? The Lord wants fellowship with his creation. He wants fellowship with you. And do you know the Lord is your Savior? If you do, he wants fellowship with you. Now, the word fellowship is a great word. It, it, it means partnership. It means a cooperation together in endeavors. It means to work together to get things done and to communicate one with another and have communion with one another as you accomplish the purpose. And so he has a job and he's doing the work in this world and he's doing that work through his people, but it's more than that. We don't just work for him, but he wants to have fellowship with us. He wants us to have fellowship with him. He wants us to talk with him. He wants to minister to us. And there's a great desire in our Lord for companionship with his people. There's another thought here, and that's the thought of commission. And the commission was that they should 
might, he might send them forth to preach. Now, he gives that here, the preaching, that's the commission. And, and you notice something else. After the resurrection, the scripture said, he came to them and said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and uh, make disciples or teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. He is saying, I've given you a commission. Now, that commission continues right on today, and that's the main commission of the church. The main reason the church exists is to evangelize the world around us. We must never lose sight of that. Uh, churches today get so concerned about organization and all the rules and regulations and all the things they're doing that sometimes they lose focus. We must not lose focus. The main objective of, uh, of the church is to fulfill the Great Commission, to get the gospel, to get everyone an opportunity to be saved. And then after they're saved, then we teach them to observe all the things of the Lord and, and disciple them and show them how to live for Christ and do the things that God wants them to do, wants us to do. But let's not lose focus. The main objective is reaching people for Christ. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, he said. He said, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and in the uttermost parts of the earth. This is the thing that must compel us. Paul said, he said, the love of Christ constrains me. I've got to go. I've got to get this message out. I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. I've got to get the message to everyone. I've got to even go to the regions beyond, he said. I want to go. I've got to get this message out. The Holy Spirit said, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul, and the work according to have I called them. What is it? Go and evangelize. Go and get the message of Christ to the nations. We've got that same goal. Folk, we've got to do it. That's what the church is all about. And so you notice the commission. But then notice the credentials that he gave them. He said... Uh, that they might preach, and then he said, and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. Those were the credentials that the Lord gave to the apostles to prove who they were. Uh, the apostle Paul said over in, uh, for, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I think about verse 12, he said, true, the signs of an apostle were done through me and through this. The signs of the apostles, that was the ability to heal the sick raise the dead, cast out demons. He didn't give that power to everybody. And he never commanded anybody to go out and heal the sick or to raise the dead or to cast out demons. That power he gave to these apostles, these ones that he had called aside and the credentials to prove that they were apostles was the ability to cast out demons and to heal the sick. And all of them did that. Does the Lord heal today? Yes, uh, I just, I believe in, in, uh, in divine healing. Yes, sir. I don't believe in divine healers, but I believe in divine healing. Amen. I know that uh, you've got to watch that. Uh, but he never he commissioned me or anybody else to go and heal the sick, not one place. The apostles he did, and he gave them credentials to prove that they were apostles. And they raised the dead. Paul did. Peter did. Uh, they were bitten by snakes. He picked up snakes when, when he was gathering firewood. He just cast it off. It didn't bother him. He spoke in all these different languages. Everywhere Paul went, he spoke in the languages of the people by divine power. And on, even on the day of Pentecost, there were 16 different nationalities, 16 different languages that were spoken on that day. There was no jibber-jabber. It was all plain languages. It was understood by those that heard it. What was the answer for it? What did it accomplish? 3,000 people got saved on the day of Pentecost. Uh, because they heard the word of God, they heard the gospel of Christ in their own language. They heard the wonderful works of God. God's not the author of confusion. We have a lot of confusion in the churches today. And where there's confusion, God's not there. He said, I'm not the author of confusion, but of peace. 
And so we might be careful about these things and, and we hold to the truth of God's word and we hold it tenaciously. We do what God has instructed us to do. And so you notice uh, the credentials were given to them and they had the signs of an apostle and they did all of these mighty and wonderful works. But now I want to get down to uh, where he said he called them, he surnamed them Boanerges, the sons of thunder. Now, you know, he didn't call any of the others that, but he did Peter and uh, he did uh, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. He called them the sons of thunder. And I don't want to call your attention over to the book of uh, Luke. And we'll, we'll go over to chapter 9 in the book of Luke. And, uh, and it's very interesting. In verse 49, Luke chapter 9 and verse 49. We're going to look this up and you'll see this. And John answered and said, Master, this is John now. Watch it. One of the sons of thunder. He said, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him, because he followeth not with us. And Jesus said unto him, forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. This son of thunder came out of him. He said, here's a guy, he's out there, he's casting out demons. We told him, you can't do that, you're not one of us. <laughs> watch on, watch it, in 51. And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers, messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. These Samaritans did not like the idea that he wasn't going to stay there and minister to them, but he was just passing through. And so they didn't receive him. And when his disciples, James and John, the sons of thunder, when they saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them as Elijah did? <laughs> Let's just burn them up. <laughs> sons of thunder. Uh, but he turned and rebuked them and said, No, you know not what manner of spirit you're of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. I want to call your attention to the fact that it's possible that some of us could have that same spirit of thunder, that same sons of thunder attitude toward others. Now, I, I'm saying to you that it's very important that we be bold in getting out the gospel. We need to be bold. But, folk, we don't need to be brash. There are some people who are brash in getting out the word, and they are offending people, not that the gospel offends them, but that they offend them by their attitude and how brash they are pretending to be bold for the Lord. Let's watch this. Let's, let's each of us be very careful that while we're bold in standing for Christ, we're not brashly running over top of other people. It is the Lord's will that we have the same spirit that Jesus had when he said, you know what kind of spirit you're of. We're, we're not a kind of a spirit to run over people. We're wanting people to be saved. We want to reach people. And so let's be careful not to be brash in our boldness. But then again, we can be doctrinally sound without being dictatorial. Amen. You know, we ought to be doctrinally sound. We ought to know what we believe and why we believe what we believe. You ought to get yourself so acquainted with the Bible and with the truth of God that any time anybody speaks something that's not truth, it would, it would stick out like a sore thumb. You've heard, and I suppose it is true, that the Secret Service used to train their people in the counterfeiting division 
by bringing them into a, a place where they trained them, and then for six months or so, they would have them handling money. But it was sure, they were sure that it was all 100% good money. And they handled all the different denominations, and they got acquainted with that money, and then they would slip in a counterfeit. And that counterfeit would stick out like a sore thumb. Well, listen, I tell you, that's the way you ought to know the Word. You ought to be so familiar with the teaching of God's Word that when someone comes up with some phony doctrine, you go, whoo, that sticks out. That's not right. You ought to know the truth. Amen. But while you're doctrinally sound, you can't be dictatorial over somebody else that doesn't quite see it like you do. <coughs> it might be possible that you might be wrong in something, in your interpretation of that thing. Watch this. You want to know what the book teaches, but in your speaking of what it teaches, it's possible for you to put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. Amen. And so we have to be very careful. Uh, you know, I, I had one time... Uh, we were, I think, in the old building, and, and I was teaching a class on soul winning. And, uh, and it was going through the, the plan of salvation and how to win somebody to Christ and, and uh, some of the things that should not be said, like give your heart to Jesus. That's totally wrong. Nobody should give their heart to Jesus. He doesn't want your old dirty heart anyway. He wants you to receive Christ as your Savior. It's been it's received him. To them give you power to become the sons of God. And there's nowhere in the Bible that tells a, a sinner to give his heart to Jesus to be saved. That's unbiblical. It's not right. And I was teaching how to show somebody how to be saved. And there were some people there from a different church that came in and wanted to sit in that. And one of these guys got up and said, that's not the way we do it. And, uh, and, you know, it was so out of place for somebody coming in from some other church and to stand up while I'm going out of my way to teach the class. That's not the way we do it. We don't think that's the way it ought to be done. This person had an attitude that their way of doing it had to be the absolute right way and it wouldn't allow of any other way. That attitude is totally wrong. You can offend good, godly people by saying, we, you've got to do it my way or the highway. You'll drive people away. I've known people that dropped out of church, went off to some other church because somebody offended them in that church. And they offended them because their way was the right way and every other way was the wrong way. And they pointed out that to those people and said, you're not doing it the right way. And because of that attitude of being dictatorial, even though they were probably right, that attitude drives people away. What I'm saying, we've got to be careful. We can't be brash. We can't run over God's people. And he said, here's people, here was one who was casting out demons. They said, he wasn't with us, so we told him to stop that right now. That's not the right way to do it. <laughs> well, Jesus uh, said, hold on. If he's not against us, he's for us. Since I have been in the ministry, I know that I have collected, I used to do a whole lot more of that than I do these days, but I've collected so many different plans of how to win a soul to Christ. Man, there's many books that are written, so many books that are written by different ones and they have a different approach and it's over and over and over. And while most of them are okay, most of them are okay. They just handle it a different way and go at it a different way. But I would not say, hey, my way's the right way, your way's the wrong way. I would never do that. Someone came to D.L. Moody one time and said, Mr. Moody, we don't like the way you go about winning souls. And D.L. Moody said, is that right? Or how do you do it? How many of you led to the Lord in the last six months? 
And the first turned real red, and they said, well, I don't guess I want anybody, Lord. Moody said, well, I like the way we're doing it, but the way you're not doing it. You see, we've got to be humble enough to realize that we may not have the only way of doing things. As long as the truth is given and the way of salvation is presented, God bless them. Amen and amen. amen. Now, I think using this little green book is the best possible way to lead somebody to Christ. I just love this little book, and this is the way we do it. But if somebody else is using some other method and they're winning people to Jesus, I say, God bless you. Amen. Hallelujah. Winning somebody, keeping somebody out of hell, giving them the way of salvation, then writing their name in glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Even if you don't do it the way I do it. And so, it's possible to be doctrinally sound, but be dictatorial. And we've got to be careful because we can offend God's people in so doing. It's also possible to be right without being rough. You can be right and be kind. You don't have to be rough. Now, some of us, old-time preachers, we used to pound the pulpit a lot. I would have pound that pulpit and more made a lot of racket and clapped our hands and ran around and shouted a little bit. And, uh, you know, I, we thought that was the only way to do it. But uh, not the only way of doing it. Did you know there's different ways of preaching? I mean, really, I have heard some preachers. I heard... Uh, I heard R.G. Lee preach. I heard his sermon on the Lordship of Christ, one of the greatest sermons I believe ever preached. And I don't think he shouted a single time in that sermon. I know he didn't clap his hands and never even hit the pulpit. <laughs> what a sermon, though. One of the greatest sermons ever preached was Jonathan Edwards' sermon on sinners in the hands of an angry God. Did you know I've listened to that sermon? It was taped. I've listened to that sermon. Here's the way he preached. And he goeth up into a mountain, and he calleth unto him whom he would. And they came unto him, and he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach and to have power to heal sickness. And it was that message just plain, it seemed almost monotone, never raised his voice, never clapped his hands. People got under such conviction of their sins, they started holding on to the post in the church and thinking they were sinking into hell, had praying, God have mercy on me, before he could preach, finish the sermon. But he didn't yell. He didn't raise his voice. I don't think he was preaching. Yeah, he was. Yeah. You see, God uses different ways to get the job done. And I'm the last person in the world that's going to criticize another preacher. If he's preaching the truth, God bless him, he's on my team, and I'm on his. Amen. And so we must be very careful lest we think we're right, and that gives us the right to be rough with somebody else and to run over somebody, and to be unkind to somebody. We must never be unkind. Jesus said, you know what not what kind of spirit you're of. The spirit of God is a spirit of love, and grace, and graciousness, and kindness. And we need to be kind one to another. We need to be gentle one with another. The psalmist said, thy gentleness, oh God, thy gentleness has made me great. Can you think about that? God's gentleness made him great. And oh, we need to be gentle one with another. We need to be kind one to another. That's God's way. Amen. It's never God's way to run over top of somebody else and to put somebody else down because they don't do it our way. I think I mentioned to you one time, I was passing over on the coast and we had a great crowd, we had a, had a, a big meeting, and uh, I invited this guest preacher to come in and preach that Saturday evening. 
and there was a young man who was probably 16 years old, and uh, we'd been, his family had been trying to get him to church, and we had mentioned to him and tried to get him, and he came that night to church. What a blessing. Now, this young man had long hair. It looked good. Ladies, you would have loved his hair. And the preacher got up and berated that young man and put him down because he had long hair. The young man was offended and left, and we tried everything in the world, but we never could get him back to church. We never could win him to Christ. I wept over that. I told my people, I said, I'm so sorry. That was not of God. That was so wrong. It was wrong. Sure, men ought to wear hair right. Sure, they ought to. But man, let, let them get them saved. Then let them get, you know, I believe in that statement. You know, go fish and you catch them and God will clean them. <laughs> and, you know, we ought not to say something to a lost person about their hair. Let's talk to them about the love of God and the fact that they need to be saved. Amen. And because they, this preacher dwelt on his hair, he drove him away where we could never reach him for Christ. That's wrong. W-R-O-N-G. With capital letters underlined and uh, emphasized and put in bold print. It's wrong. We cannot offend people by saying things like that and drive them away from Christ. Our job is to love people to Jesus. The love of Christ constrains us. And we've got to reach out in love and reach people. And so James and John were known as the sons of thunder. Call down fire from God. Burn them all up. Ah, boy, we're going to stand for the truth. He's not with us out there casting out demons and not doing it under our umbrella. Oh, we told him, you can't do that. Not right. Jesus said, shame on you. Shame on you. What kind of spirit do you think you're of? A spirit where you can come down on somebody else and condemn somebody else when they're doing right? Just because they're not doing it your way? Now, I personally believe that every preacher ought to preach in a suit with shirt and tie and polished shoes and black socks. Thank you. But I'm going to tell you this right now. If one of these modern preachers comes in with a t-shirt full of holes and pants full of holes and tennis shoes and all of that business, and as long as he's preaching Christ and him crucified, turn to Jesus, he wants to keep you out of hell, he's my friend. Amen. I don't like the way he dresses, but I like what he preaches. We've got to be careful, folks. We can offend people so easily. Now, I don't like a lot of the modern music, the so-called 7-Eleven music, seven verses repeated 11 times over, you know. I, I, don't, I don't care for that. But if that church is upholding Jesus Christ and preaching Christ and him crucified in one way to heaven, and that's Jesus, turn to Jesus from your sins. He'll forgive you, give you his gift of eternal life. Let him sing on if you're getting people to Jesus. Amen. Let's stop being critical of others when the criticism is driving people away from Christ. Now, if somebody's not preaching the truth, then uh, may the judgment of God come on him. That's what Paul said. If he preaches some other gospel, let him be accursed. But as long as he's preaching Jesus, as long as he's preaching truth, 
You'll never hear me criticize him, even if I don't like his tennis shoes. That, that wasn't meant as a criticism. That was meant as a little bit of a levity toward the end of that. You understand? And we had to be careful, folks, what I'm saying. You know, one thing happened, and one thing that moves me as I read this story about James and John, the sons of thunder. You know what? After they'd been with Jesus for three years, something wonderful changed. It, it was wonderful. After they sat at his feet and after they walked with Jesus and got to know Jesus a little better, James had his head cut off for Jesus. And John became known as the beloved disciple, the disciple whom Jesus loved, the disciple of love. That's John. Have you ever read 1 John? Five chapters full of love. Love. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Love not in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Here it is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be propitiation for our sins. God is love. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. On and on and on and on, John talks about the love of God. And he known, he's no longer known as the son of thunder, but he's known as the beloved disciple. Oh, what a difference when somebody spends time with Jesus. And the more you spend time with Jesus, the more love is going to be in your heart. The Apostle Paul said, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints, know with all the saints the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ that passes knowledge, that you might be filled with the fullness of God. There it is. If we love people, we want to get them to Jesus. We don't want to drive people away from Jesus. He said the Son of Man came to bring them to himself, not to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Amen. May God help us to walk with Jesus so much that we're just overflowing with the love of God. The apostle said these words in the book of Romans, and tribulation, work of patience, and patience, experience, and experience, hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. When we walk with God and we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we're going to be filled with love for others, love for the saints and love for the lost, that we might bring them to Jesus. And all of God's people said,